So how many of you have to deal with difficult people in your life? All right. All right. How many of you have one of those people sitting next to you right now? No, 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 don't, don't raise your hand. You know, this is a, uh, that's right. We can get you in trouble in church, yeah. yeah. Dealing with difficult people is, is such a tough thing for, for anybody, but as Christians, there's, there, there's a tension that we have here when we, when we deal with difficult people, because we know there's a call to, to love people as, as God has loved them, yet at the same time, there's some things that are going on that aren't good for that person. They're not good for, for you when you're involved in that, and, and so it becomes kind of tricky when we have to, to deal with them. Uh, Rick Warren actually had a phrase for, for difficult people. He called them EGRs, extra grace required, actually is, uh, was his phrase for that. And, and we have people like that in our lives. And we're going to talk today about um, how, what, what might a Christian response might look like to that, how, how to love them, but also how to not play the game and, and what that would look like for us. So we are in a series right now called The Miracle of Mercy. And, and we've been talking about what it looks like to show mercy in, in different kinds of circumstances, how that's, that's something that, as, as followers of Jesus, all of us are called to do. We're called to be people of mercy because well, we imitate Jesus. We follow him and his ways. And, and when we, we've talked before, too, that, that the most common emotion that's used to describe Jesus was he had compassion on people, and he, and he kept showing mercy over and over again. And so if, if we're going to imitate Jesus, if we're going to become like him, this just has to be part of our lives. It has to be part of who we are. And we want it to, to flow out of that relationship with God. And, and so that, that kind of frames the context for, for how we talk about mercy, especially as we show that towards difficult people. And, and so the very first thing we're going to talk about this morning is that we're, we're always called to love and extend grace. We're always called to do that. And that even includes people that annoy you. Would you believe that? Yes, we're, we're called to, to love and, show and, and extend grace. And the Bible talks about this a number of different ways, but here, here's a couple of places where, where Paul writes this. Would you read this uh, Colossians passage with me? Bearing with one another, and if only one... I, I, all right, that didn't work out right. So anyway, the, 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 the last part there... Yeah, you must also forgive because you've been forgiven. And then also with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. That, that, th those are just two principles anyway that God has called us to do, to, to forgive, first of all, as we have been forgiven, right? It's not, it's not that, that we do it out of our own resources. It's not that we do it just because we're nice people. We forgive because we've first been forgiven. And, and then also we, we bear with one another uh, out of out of love for God, and and we, we it's always brings us back to the cross. We understand who who God is, who who he, he sent Jesus to love us and and to extend Himself to pour Himself out on our behalf, and so that becomes the starting point for us to extend love and grace uh, as as it's been shown to us. You ever wonder if God has ever viewed you or or me as a difficult person? I don't know what the conversations are in heaven, but uh, I don't know. You know, there's a God who loves you, uh, and he, he's, he's claimed you, he's called you as his own, but he doesn't always like everything you do. And there's probably sometimes he goes, why, why did they do that? Why? You know, why? And, and we're, we're difficult oftentimes. And what a, what a wonderful thing it is that, that God didn't decide to come down to this world and to die on our behalf because we were worthy of it. That, that wasn't why he did it. It's not because we were worthy and because we were just awesome and God said, I have to do this. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Righteous for the unrighteous. He entered into that to, to a bunch of broken people and a bunch of difficult people. That's who he came to save. And so, in some sense, we're all difficult people, extra grace required, not just a little bit, but the kind that, that comes about by the Son of God uh, choosing to take on the wrath of God uh, on the cross so that we didn't have to face that. 
That's the kind of people we are. And so that, that just kind of frames the discussion, gives us a perspective that's important as we talk about this. We're called to love and to show grace to everyone. And, and sometimes it's best to just overlook an offense. If, um, you know, if, if you had to like stop and pause every time someone said something inconsiderate to you and you had to point it out or, or every time they did something just kind of dumb, you would not live much of life, would you? I mean, there, there's just, this stuff happens all the time. And, and the Bible teaches us that, that it's, it's a wise thing to do to sometimes overlook an offense. In fact, let's, let's read this verse from Proverbs together. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. Right. You always have that as an option. Right. You can always just ignore something that someone else does. You can just let it go. A few weeks ago, we talked about forgiveness and, and how that actually literally means to let something go, to, 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 get, to, to set aside your right to get even. And, and, and in one sense, when you overlook someone's faults, when you overlook an insult, when you overlook you know, something like that, you're, you're just, you're, you're doing that. And sometimes that's just the right thing to do. It's not always the right thing to do, but sometimes it is. And, and here, here's what William James said. The art of being wise is the art of knowing what to overlook, right? That, that, that's a mark of a wise person, a prudent person, uh, of knowing that you don't have to address every little thing, but some things you can just overlook. And, and when we deal with difficult people, um, that's just going to come up. There's going to be all kinds of things that come up related to that. Now, um, there are a few different types of difficult people we're going to talk about this morning, and, and we're, we're just going to hit, a, hit on three of them this morning. There are a lot more than this, and you, you know that. Uh, and so we're going to paint with some very broad brush strokes as part of this. But uh, anyway, let's, let's just let's talk about this for a little bit. Um, first, first is the overly critical person. Now, anybody ever have to deal with that in their lives? Overly critical people? Right. Now, this is different than just people who are offering constructive criticism, because we, we all need that. We need people that will ref, reflect reality back to us. Uh, I, I remember when I was in seminary and, and gave my first sermon, and, and you know, uh, I thought it was really going awesome. Then I watched a video of it, and I'm like, whoa, that was not what was going on in my mind. That is, it, the, the, the reality of the video showed something very different than what I had pictured going on. And, and sometimes we just need things like that that can reflect reality back to us because we've, we've distorted it in our minds somehow. People that can reflect that back to us. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talk today, we are talking about people that are overly critical, where there is like nothing you can do right. And, and, and they will like kind of nitpick every little thing and, and nothing's ever good enough. And, and oftentimes... Um, it, you, you might feel the weight of this, but it's probably not just you feeling the weight of this because overly critical people probably just aren't overly critical with you. <laughs> They're probably that way with a whole bunch of people. And, and, and they'll notice that they have a hard time having close friends. And, and, and sometimes when they're coming into a room, people just kind of like, oh, <laughs> it just kind of takes the life out of them a little bit because they kind of know something's going to happen. And they might not even be overly critical of you to your face. They might be overly critical of other people to your face. Uh, but then you sort of have this idea that if they're saying this about everybody else, uh, what happens when I'm not in the room? And, and uh, so it, it's just something that we, we deal with all the time. And, and if, if you're in, a, in an environment where you're around this all the time at work, sometimes it's even in the home, um, this, this will weigh on you. This, this will, will, will keep you down in, in a very, very tough way. And, and so we go, what, what do you do with that? What do you do with overly critical people? That, that is a distinctly Christian response here. Well, Paul had to deal with this uh, sometimes, and he, let's, let's read what he did in 1 Thessalonians 2.4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. 
And what, what Paul is saying, just in just kind of a different way, is that when we run into overly critical people, we actually don't really even try to please them. In fact, what we do is we focus on living for an audience of one. An audience of one. And what we mean by that is, of course, it's God. Now, when we have these overly critical people in our life, uh, 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 you know that you're just not going to be able to please them no matter what happens. And, and, and at some point, you eventually realize it's not really about you. It's not really you and what, what you're doing. It's, it's really more about them and some of their issues that they've got going on that are spilling out out of them and onto you. I mean, that's, that's kind of what's happening here. And, and at some point you realize there's probably nothing I could do that would ever be good enough. And, and so there, uh, part of it is to go, you know, um, maybe the issue isn't me, maybe it's them. And, and, and maybe, maybe my goal should not necessarily be to please them in the first place. Maybe they're just gonna have to be disappointed disappointed. Uh, maybe I need to just focus on living for that audience of one to be approved by God. So um, I have a story that kind of runs this point and the next point together. Um, so I was, I was a brand new pastor, just been a month out of seminary at my first church. I was in Bremerton and it was time for the first voters assembly. And, you know, I, I don't really know what, what's going on. And just kind of ran it without me. And, and, and the church had these plans they were moving forward on. And all of a sudden, this, this one guy got up to speak. And, like, like the, the whole room went, oh, no. <laughs> like it, it, so, I, you know, I just kind of watched what went on. And, and this guy got up to speak and just kind of, like, undid all the progress and everything that was, like, going to move forward in the church because he, there were just possibilities and worries and what about this and that. And, and it just, it just the, everything that was going to happen just died right there. And so I just, I, I asked some of the elders and stuff after, so like, what was that about? And they go, oh, this happens every single time. I'm like, wow, really? Um, and, and it turns out it was just kind of a, a narcissistic person. And, and, and just kind of wanted to be all about them and such. And so we, we just took some steps. And, and by the way, here, here's the good thing about um, people who are, are, are difficult is oftentimes they're very predictable. <laughs> and, and, and when there's, a, when there's a, a repeated pattern of behavior, you can kind of like, you're like a prophet almost. You can see the future of kind of what's going to happen. <laughs> and, and so we just did a little bit of preparations for that. And, and sure enough, the, six months later, the next voter assembly came around and, and, and we were ready for that and said, you know, hey, th 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 those are interesting points. Uh, if it actually turns out to really be an issue, we'll look at it, but I'm going to suggest we keep going. And boom done and, 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 it, and it changed the, it changed the course of the conversation that a, a difficult person was actually holding a whole group of people hostage in some way and, and so that, that actually kind of goes to this next part when you run into manipulative people you have to redefine the relationship and and so sometimes uh, this this will take different different kinds of uh, form in our life where you run into manipulative people. Um, this, this one example up here, this, this actually comes from the, the Samson, the, the, you know, the story of Samson, one of the judges in the Bible. And, and he had this, this lady friend, Delilah, and, and she really was not a nice person. She kept trying to manipulate him and figure out how to get rid of his strength and, and, you know, and, 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 and was the kind of person that said, you know, if you really love me, you would tell me how to, you know, make you weak. Uh, and, and anyway, uh, he actually falls for that. And Delilah is, is just one kind of manipulative person that, that we run into sometimes. And, and sometimes these people will, will do things like, um, they'll say things like, if you loved me, you would do this for me. Or, or there's other times, a type of manipulation is, if you don't, I will. It's kind of like a threat. Uh, I, I'm going to leave, or I'm going to get mad, or I'm going to withhold my love. There's just th th those are two of the common types of, of manipulation. So, you know, someone says, "If you love me, you would do this for me," or "If you don't, I will." You know, X. And, and friends, those are not um, not healthy things. 
It's just not, that's not God's way of doing things for us. And, and sometimes we find ourselves caught in the middle of that. And, and so what we have to do is to redefine the relationship because nobody wants to feel like they're being manipulated. Nobody wants to, to feel like that. And so, so he, here's what, what this could look like for you. Um, it, 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 to say, we're, we're going to stop this. We're going to change directions here. And so if, if someone has been manipulating you by saying, you know, if you loved me, you would do this. And, and if it's been going on for a while, it, it, it will be a, a tough thing to change the pattern. But, but remember this, you have to pick your heart, right? Pick your heart. What I mean by that is you, you either do something that's very difficult once, that's hard, or you deal with the hard part of living with it every day, the consequences of not doing the right thing that has to get done. You pick your heart either way. And, and if, if someone were, were going to say, you know, we, we want to redefine this relationship, we want to make a change, it, it's, it can be simply saying, uh, actually, I do love you, we're just not going to do this. It's just saying, I, I do love you, and that's not fair to say that. Um, but we're, we're, we're not going to play this game anymore. We're not going to go that direction. I'm sorry that that disappoints you. We're not going to do that. But, but it, it, and by the way, it might take some practice for this first, you, if, if you've been, you know, if it's been going on a long time. Sometimes too, even, even with the aggressive kind of person, uh, that can be a little more scary. But once again, it's a very kind of similar thing where someone says, you know, if, if you don't, I will, or if you don't, I won't, whatever. And you say, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but this is not going to happen. We're not, I'm not going to do that anymore. We're, we're going we're gonna to do things a little bit differently from now on. And friends, it will be hard. You'll have to pick that hard, but it can change your life. And it's, it's a good thing for you, and it's a good thing for that person because that person is sinning against you and they are manipulating you. And we, we, just, we, ha- we do those kind of things in a healthy way. Jesus had, had Pharisees and scribes that would try to manipulate him. But did you ever once see Jesus get manipulated? Nope. Never once. Never once. He understood that that, that wasn't part of God's plan. And so he, he, was, he was strong in that way. Here, here's the, the final type here. Uh, an overly needy person. Uh, with an overly needy person, we need to give them what's truly needed, not necessarily what they ask for. Now, there are normal kinds of needs. That, that if, if somebody is hurt or, somebody, or there's something they can't do for themselves, uh, the, the, those are the kinds of needs that, that we are actually called to meet. And we're, we're, we're called to show acts of mercy uh, to, to those kinds of things. Uh, and and, and there, there are very healthy ways and we do that. And, and most of the time, that's how it is. We, we, are, we are showing mercy where it needs to be shown. But sometimes there are people in our life that uh, seem to be overly needy. In fact, you might call them like drama queen or drama king. I mean, there's, there's just some, some different names we might have for it, but it's, a, it's an overly needy type of person that always has to have it about them. So, uh, another variation of this is someone that like just talks all the time and, and, and just doesn't let anybody else ever get a word in. That's another type of overly needy person. And, and to figure out how do you love people like that and how do you show them mercy and, and, and love them is, is sometimes a tough thing to do. And, and once again with that, we, we have to um, give them what they need, not necessarily what they ask for. There are people in your life that will ask you for things that really aren't appropriate. And, and, um, and sometimes as Christians, we go, well, if they ask, maybe I should just give it to them. But that's not always a good thing, healthy thing for them or for you. And so we, we, we need to have the, the courage in one sense to actually stop and say, you know, let, let's, let's do what Jesus says about being wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We want to love people, but do it in a healthy way and ask ourselves, is the request that person making really the loving thing to do? Well, I mean, would that really be the best thing for them if we did that? Or are they asking for something that's maybe a little bit beyond that? 
because uh, as we've talked about a, a, a couple sermons ago, that, that sometimes people um, will just let people do things for them that they should be doing for themselves. That ultimately creates a type of dependency and other stuff like that, which is just not a loving thing to do. And so sometimes we have to break that cycle and say, you know what, we're, we're going to make a change where we're not going to do this anymore. In fact, uh, um, you know, so, uh, no, matter, no matter how that works. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we just have to say no. And part of that is saying, we're just not going to play that game. We're not going to play that game. You, you know what? Uh, and and this, this is true for any of the difficult people we've talked about. This is not, uh, not, not, just, not just for, for only needy people. That, that if, if you switch up the game, it doesn't work anymore. If, if, if you make a change, if you change your part in it, the whole way that they've been operating can't work any longer. And it, it's kind of like what, what Proverbs 26 says. Let's read this together. Without wood, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, a coral dies down. As charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. So if you've got somebody that likes to argue, if you just say, hey, I'm not going to play that game, and you just stop arguing, they can't just argue with themselves. Right? I mean, well, they can, but that's just weird. And, uh, and, it, just, and it usually just kind of, kind of stops things. And, and it's true with, with most of these things that we've been talking about, with difficult people, it, it takes two people to play the game. And, 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 and we don't want to feel like we're victims that are helpless and, and can't, can't do anything about that. We actually want to say, you know, all right, what would God have me do in this situation? What would it look like to operate out of, out of the wholeness that Christ desires in me and, and to, to have this relationship go in a healthy way? And, and to think about that and to pray about that and ask God to, to, to re give you wisdom and strength to, to do that thing so that, that difficult people aren't the ones that are, are maybe running your life. That's, that's what we're looking for. That's what we seek to do as, as a follower of Jesus. Now, here's uh, one more thing to think about. It's possible that maybe uh, you, you need some additional help with this. And, and here's, a, here's, a, here's a resource. This is a Dr. John Townsend, he, he and Henry Cloud wrote like the Boundaries books. See, they're, they're Christian psychologists that write first from the perspective of a Christian and then a psychologist. And, and they, they do some very just practical things. And so handling difficult people, if, if you've got to deal with this, here's just one thing to, to dive in a little bit deeper than what we could ever talk about on a Sunday morning. Now, it, it's possible too, as, as we've talked about some of these things, um, you might have recognized yourself as being a difficult person. That, that you go, wow, I wonder if, if I do that, or at times I am like that. And if, if, that's, if that's where you are, um, we want to do the same thing that, that David did when, when Nathan confronted him about his sin with, with Bathsheba and killing Uriah. And, and, and after that, David, David saw the sin. He saw that how he had been, he, how he had wronged them, how he had wronged God, and and he he wrote the, that beautiful Psalm fifty one. He said, "Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me." One of the best things about a relationship with God is we can change. In fact, the, the whole journey of a relationship with God it, it is about Him transforming us. About, about we're not the same people that we used to be. God wants us to change. He wants us to become more and more like Jesus. And so e even if we find ourselves as, as the difficult person sometimes, it doesn't have to continue that way. That we can say, God, would you change me? Would you forgive me? And, and let's, let's start again. Well, dear friends, my hope for you is as followers of Jesus that you would seek to, to love all the people that God's put in your life, but, but to, to not play the game of the difficult person. When it, when it comes to critical people, remember whose opinion really counts. You're doing this for an audience of one. When it comes to, to dealing with manipulative people, remember, you can change the game. 
You don't have to play that game. You can redefine that relationship because it's oftentimes a very predictable pattern that they'll follow. And, and with needy people, ask God for wisdom about what they really need. What, what do they really need from you, which might not be what they ask from you. And, and watch God use you to bring about not just health uh, in, in yourself, but spiritual health and wholeness in those people as well. Let's pray.